Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Envy, in fact, is one of the human beings' most destructive qualities or traits or characteristics, human emotion. It has the capacity and potential to completely blind someone from the inanity of his own human disposition. The good in someone becomes a cause of lamentation in another, in another person. And the envious sees only what is enviable and not the other person's many shortcomings and many defects. Envy then, as the proverb states, uh, sees the ship but cannot see the leak in that ship. Or envy sees the bridge but it can't see the swamp that the bridge crosses. Or envy looks at the swamp most tragically and in fact sees a sea instead. In Walter Gibson's book, The Boat, one of the things that he recounts is an incident in the Second World War after the torpedoing of the Dutch ship Roseboom uh, in the Indian Ocean. And he, of course, was one of the 135 survivors in that torpedoing of, of the ship. And he makes specific mention of an incident that pertained to some of the uh, survivors who were in a ship and they decided to uh, jump overboard because uh, of their fear of uh, loss of food or, or water. In any case, they jumped overboard and immediately they began to resent and show envy towards those who were still on the ship. And he was quite uh, struck by this incident, uh, that those who were had jumped overboard had now relinquished their chance of safety on the ship and had willingly chosen to jump overboard, but they began to envy those who were still on the ship. And one of their last actions was in fact to pull the bung to allow water inside the ship. And they began to throw off rations from the ship overboard because they didn't want those who were on the ship to survive. And he de described it as a madness. And he said, indeed, it was a, a source of madness in that they um, wanted to uh, not only take everyone, not only uh, allow themselves to perish, but they wanted to make sure everyone goes down with them. Envy then, in some respects, as a proverb states, is actually a beast that will gnaw at its own leg when it finds nothing else to gnaw at. One of the things that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us is to remember the value of altruism, to remember the, the importance of self-reflection and to think about the, the plight of others and the many privileges and benefits that we have in our lives. He taught us about gratitude, he taught us about sympathy for other human beings and he taught us also about divine decree, that everything that we have or don't have in fact is, is from the will of God alone himself. In fact, on a very beautiful occasion, he once instructed a very young boy. He said, listen, young boy, I will teach you some words. Remember them. He said, keep God in your mind. Be mindful of God and God will be mindful of you. Allah will be mindful of you. He said, remember Allah, keep Allah in your mind and you will find Allah in front of you. And when you ask, ask only from Allah. And when you seek refuge, seek refuge only with Allah. And here comes a very beautiful uh, part of that tradition, that hadith, when the Prophet said, and you should remember and realize everything that came your way was never going to miss you. And everything that has struck you was never going to pass you by. Meaning everything that came to you was intended by God specifically and only for you. And he says that remember that victory comes by patience and rescue comes from uh, constriction and relief comes with hardship. And that everything that comes your way comes from God alone. So the first thing we should remember then with regards envy or never to become enviable uh, is to remember that every benefit, every blessing is from God alone. Muslims are encouraged in fact to always attribute goodness to God alone so that we do not contribute to a climate of envy. We say things like وَمَا تَوْفِيقِ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ that There is no success uh, except with God alone. The Prophet taught mo most beautifully when he was uh, encouraging those uh, p people to say when they're being praised by other people. Because of course envy is so delicate. It's easy for anyone to show envy at any moment in time. And it happens on a day-to-day -day basis uh, at all times, at all human junctions. He said you should say uh, Allahumma la tu'akhidni bima yaqulun. Oh Allah, do not hold me to account for what they say about me. Waghfirli ma la ya'lamun. And forgive me for what they don't know about me. And make me better than what they think of me. 
So all all of the goodness that people see in others then is directly immediately is directed immediately to God Himself and not to the person himself. So of course that will impede or hamper uh, any um, envy shown towards that person if he realizes that the good that he has is not from himself but it's from God alone. The Prophet would oftentimes visit the poor, he would visit the sick, he would visit those on the fringes of human society. He would visit the um, the, the orphans and, and visit the, the widows to teach them about patience. That in, in some cases, if they do not have what the others might have, it does not mean that they lose hope. It does not mean that they show envy to others uh, and wish that they had what the others had uh, just because they don't have themselves, but rather that they bear patiently and God will reward them for that patience. Everything that comes our way, whether good or whether difficult or whether terrible or bad, is from God alone. And God is testing us with regards to our patience and with regards to our our degree of gratitude to Him. So rather than being envious of others, think to the things that we already actually have within us. And this is something that is from the prophetic paradigm. In one specific tradition, the Prophet said, Look to those who have less than you, not to those who have more or who are higher than you. Look to those who are lower than you, not to those who are higher than you. Because if you do that, if you look to those who are higher than you, it will make you undermine or underestimate the favor of Allah upon you. You would always think that I want more, but oftentimes we forget the many blessings we already have. We forget, and Allah mentions in the Quran, "Alam najalahu aynain, walisan wa shafatain wa hadinahu najdain." Have we not given man two eyes and two lips and a tongue? Allah is bringing us back to reality. Think about the things you already have: the fact that we can see the world, that we can hear the world, that we have human emotion, we can feel, the fact that we have ears, we can hear the world, the fact that we can walk. Like one of the scholars said, I became angry when a man stole my shoes uh, from the mosque or he took them by accident um, until the day that I saw a person who has no feet or who has no legs. And then I began to realize that what is, what is it that I would show anger uh, towards the fact that my shoes are stolen, but I, I, I failed to remember the one who has no feet or, shoe, or, or legs in the first place that he can't experience the joy of walking on this earth with shoes. Um, and it's a beautiful account. The Prophet, therefore, peace be upon him, taught us never to become envious of other people, but rather to aspire for something that is far, far greater than that. In the beginning, we have, of course, the injunction in the Quran or the um, the prayer in the Quran when we seek refuge with God. وَمِنْ شَرِّ حَسَدٍ إِذَا hasad. We seek refuge with God from every envious one when he shows envy. So we, we ask God for protection against envy because there are so many crimes of envy. Just like uh, the account that Walter Gibson illustrates, there are so many crimes. There are murders for envy. There are rapes based on, and the rationale oftentimes is envy. And there are burglaries, and the rationale is going to be envy. And there are so many incidents, you hear them on a day-to-day -day basis like that. But the Prophet taught us something completely different, and Islam is, instructs something entirely different. Because the focus in Islam is not this material world. It is not consumerism. It is not that, and of course you hear these stories of consumers in there uh, who would create a chaotic uh, scenes outside shops at 3, 4 uh, a.m. in the morning uh, uh, for a new pair of trainers, for example, and they would bro break the door and they would uh, stampede and they would, uh, you know, harm others for the sake of their own, uh, for their own uh, uh, chance of buying a pair of trainers or something of the sort. Muslims are not supposed to have that same kind of attitude uh, in being uh, so eager for the uh, for the transitory things of this world, but rather the focus is in the next life. So in the Quran, for example, Allah does tell us to compete, but compete for something else. And Allah tells us to race, but race for something else. And Allah says, وَسَابِقُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ Race to the forgiveness of your Lord. Compete for the forgiveness of your Lord. And for paradise, as wide as the heavens and the earth that Allah has prepared for the people of 
piety. Allah says, Fafirru ilallah and flee all of you back to Allah. That is the thing that is of the best thing. The Prophet, one of his most favorite prayers, in fact, was asking God for the goodness of this life, which might include good things, good clothes, and good shoes, and a good uh, uh, transport, and a good house. All these things are fine to have, but never at the expense where we will start showing envy uh, for others who might have a bit more. We should remember, my dear brothers and sisters, uh, that every behind every Every uh, joy, happiness, there might be a tear. Behind every wealth, there might be a problem. Behind every health, there might be a sickness. And we should remember that. We should be people of gratitude for everything and teach our children the same. Never to become arrogant, never to become envious, never to become, um, you know, never to uh, undermine the favor of Allah upon you for anything, small or big, distant or far. It makes no difference. And so we should teach our children that about gratitude and to show thankfulness to God for even the most meager and the minute of things, because that will then create a climate of contentment and a climate of gratitude rather than a climate of envy and a climate of hate and resentment for other people for the things that they might have at certain times in their lives. Of course, we know that sometimes we, there are many people who have blessings, but then they're taken away from them immediately. And we might have health, but then it's taken away from us immediately. We might go from health to sickness or from wealth to poverty or from having free time to becoming very occupied or from living and then ultimately uh, to dying and from being young and to then to being old immediately. So we should remember then, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, that we should be thankful to God for everything. The Prophet, uh, in, in fact, in the Quran, there is a very specific verse where Allah says that indeed very few of God's servants are thankful to him. And the Prophet's companion, Umar ibn al-Khattab, was once walking the streets and he heard a man who was praying. And he was saying, Oh Allah, Oh God, make me amongst those who are few. Make me amongst those who are few. And Umar was perplexed and he asked him, Well, who are those then who are few? And he said, Have you not heard the words of God, Allah, in the Quran, that only a few of Allah's servants are truly thankful to him? So we should begin by thanking Allah for everything that we have and to focus to on the hereafter and never to become people of envy and teach our children the same. May Allah protect all of us from this. In an age where uh, celebrity culture is so pervasive as it is today, and things like fashion and cosmetics and the artificial beauty uh, is so decisive and it almost dictates uh, a person's sphere of influence and whether he will be liked or disliked in this world, and where the image is set against the ideal and the image is so more important and the ideal kind of takes a back foot. Um, we should remember the great importance the Prophet placed, in fact, on the importance of the ideal over the image. It's almost a paradigm shift. It's going back. It's, it's changing the natural order that we see in the world today. And I want to simply mention a, a very beautiful story pertaining to one individual uh, who was not the image or he was not the aesthetically beautiful. He was not, he didn't have the good looks, nor did he have uh, the social, was he in, the, in the, the best social class, nor did he have the best social standing, nor did he have a good job, nor did he have parents of whom we know. His lineage is unknown, his parents are unknown, we don't know what tribe he came from. His name was Julebib, and even the name uh, is, is from his description because he's Jalbab, because he's dwarf-like, and so he was very short, very diminutive. And, and people found that quite repulsive and they were repelled by that. They kept their distance from him. And there are many people in the world who are like that. Uh, not everyone is the same. Society is a complex mesh of all kinds of individuals. There are some who are poor, there are some who are rich, and some who are very good looking, and others who are not like that. And there are some who have good social statuses and others who are not like that. But what does Islam say about that? And do we simply remain with our cliques and remain with our social groupings when it's very easy or familiarity when we're familiar with people? No, Islam is not like that and teaches us something very, very different, very distinct. And this individual, Abib, people kept their distance. But the one who approached him was the Prophet himself, peace be upon him. And the Prophet on one occasion inquired about him and he inquired about his well-being. Like, what is your story, Julebib? What is happening with you? Are you married these days? And Julebib, of course, said that uh, there is no chance of me getting married when I don't even have a companion. I don't even have a friend, let alone an intimate wife or intimate partner. And so the Prophet went to make inquiries about him for him. 
and he knocked on one of the homes of one of the people of the Ansar, the, the supporters, those who helped the Prophet in Medina, and he inquired about marrying Julebib to the daughter in living in that home with her parents. And the parents were astonished, and they said, you know, we would marry our daughter happily to anyone except Julebib. Again, they were looking for the image, and, and, and that should be the thing that dictates uh, whether or not they would uh, allow their daughter to marry somebody, or wealth, uh, or privilege, or status, or, lineage, or lineage. But Julebib had none of them, but he had the ideal for sure. He was known for his goodness, and his good mannerism, and his obedience to Allah and his Prophet. In any case, the daughter, she did end up marrying Julebib, uh, because she was concerned about what the Prophet had uh, to offer uh, as a marriage partner. Now, the the story, in fact, concerning Julebib uh, almost comes to a halt. We don't actually know that much more about him, except one tradition uh, collected in one book of hadith, one book of prophetic tradition, when the Prophet was coming back from an expedition, and there were many who were killed in that expedition, many who survived also. And the Prophet, he uh, inquired and he says, are you missing anybody here? He asked his companions and they said, we are missing nobody, O Prophet of Allah. And then he asked the question the second time, are you missing anybody? And then they, uh, then they said the second time, we are missing nobody. And then he asked the third time, do you miss anybody? And they said, no, we miss nobody else. Uh, we've counted everybody that, we, we, that were absent from us. But then the Prophet said, but I myself, I miss Julebib. The Prophet turned his attention towards the one that they would never attend their attention to. The Prophet considered the one that they were mindless of. The Prophet considered the one that was socially deprived. The Prophet considered the one who had very little. But in his eyes and from his perspective, he had so much more and was given credit and credence for that. And the, um, the Prophet says to them, go and, uh, go and find him. And so they went off and they went to try and find where he was, on the battlefield or somewhere else. And they found him on the battlefield and he had been killed. And around him were others, enemies who had been killed. And the Prophet was informed and the Prophet went to him. And the Prophet, Prophet stood by his body and the Prophet said it like this. He turned to him and he said, هذا مني وأنا منه. This man is from me and I am from him. This man is from me and I am from him. This man is from me and I am from him. And it was a very moving episode, in fact, for the Prophet's companions because they were marveled by the fact how this man had been transformed by the recognition of the Prophet himself. How many a people do we see in society like that who live on the fringes of society? People you might find in the mosque or you might find in the streets or you might find in the classroom or you might find in places and they kind of have their own corner, have their own space. And nobody talks to them and nobody asks them, like the Prophet asked him, what is your story, Julebib? Do we give people like that the our time of day? The Prophet gave his time of day to this man, Julebib, and it transformed him. And it transformed how he was perceived in society. So that when he said to him on his death that this man is from me and I am from him, the Prophet gave him a very special place. And not did he, he didn't do that for all of his companions at every time when they had been killed or had died, for example. And then the narrator mentions another interesting piece of information and says that the Prophet placed Julebib, this man of whom we don't even know his name or his parents' name or his lineage or his tribe or anything else, the Prophet placed him in his arms and the narrator says that the Prophet placed him in his arms and Julebib had no pillow on that day except the arms of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And that is an interesting piece of information about why it was included in the first place. Because that's Julebib. It's almost as if the prophets provided for him. The prophets brought him close to himself, shown human empathy for him. And that is the essence of Islam. Islam does not discriminate with regard to those from one social class or another one. Islam is suitable for all. So in our dealings in human society, then when we're out in the streets or at work or we're in the mosque or we're doing our daily business, we sometimes find people like that. And there are many people in the world who are like that. Those who are socially deprived, who don't have the good um, uh, well-being as we do, or who have the good upbringing perhaps as we do, or have the same kind of jobs as we might do. We have an obligation as Muslims, as people, 
to care for them, to respect them, to give them recognition, to give them kind words, and to bring them in, bring them close. For that was the instruction of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And that is the ethics of Islam. And that is an example of Islam and its role with regard to social justice. May Allah make us all like that. And may Allah bless those who are socially deprived and may Allah give them uh, good people to tend for them and to care for them and respect them. And may Allah make this world a better place for us and our children to live in by way of the good things and the good deeds that we do to help other people. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.